The Fourth Crusade is often considered one of the pivotal events of world history. Although the depiction almost always focuses on the sack of Constantinople in 1204, the prelude and the aftermath of the sack are really important too. In this video, we'll talk about the rise of the Second Bulgarian Tsardom, the rise and fall of the Latin Empire, the struggle for supremacy in the region, and the final restoration of the Eastern Roman Empire. These long videos are very difficult to make, so consider liking, sharing, and commenting. And if your hair is like the Byzantine Empire, that is to say it's disappearing over time, check out the sponsor of this video, Keeps. It's a subscription service that delivers clinically approved hair loss treatments right to your door, at half the cost of pharmacy prices. Our lead historian probably could have used this a while back, and now it's too late. In fact, two out of three men experience hair loss by the time they're 35, but by taking action you can avoid this fate. Keeps will set you up with clinically backed treatments to prevent hair loss and encourage growth, with most users seeing results after six months. Plus, the treatment plan includes unlimited round-the-clock messaging with on-staff medical professionals to tailor your own hair care system with personal recommendations. You can add their award-winning thickening shampoo and conditioner to help even further, and all their products get refill reminders to make sure you're always good to go. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash kings or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash kings. The Komnenian restoration that started in 1081 by Alexios I Komnenos provided a devastated Eastern Roman Empire still reeling from the defeat at Menzikert, the reforms it needed to survive. Three emperors of this dynasty, who ruled for a century, changed the course of history, leading to a cultural, military and territorial expansion, as well as opening the gates for the Crusades that would ultimately undo all of their progress. Alexius I and his son, John II, knew that one of the most necessary and radical changes was the replacement of the theme system which, while effective, was extremely expensive to upkeep. The solution to this problem was a new system that was much more feudal and centralized, giving power to the royal family. Only the emperor could hand out the titles required for one to become a landowner, pronoi, who then had to supply Constantinople with taxes and manpower. In a very short span, the local aristocracy declined in favor of the extended royal family, which received most of the titles and land. The competition was fierce, and the entire system relied on a capable ruler who could rein in his family, with the result being a cheaper, smaller army that was easier to control. On the economic front, the debased currency of the empire, Solidus, was replaced with a gold coinage of higher fineness, commonly called the Hyperprion. The empire experienced a revival in mosaic art, built many new churches and fortifications, and annually hosted fairs and jousting tournaments. Then came Manuel I, who much like Justinian, was energetic and ambitious, waging wars constantly. In 1167, Hungary was defeated at the Battle of Sirmium and forced to become a vassal of the empire. In Italy, Manuel first supported Conrad III of Germany against the Normans and then the Pope in his conflict with the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Frederick Barbarossa. He also fought wars against the Seljuks, pushing all the way to their capital of Iconium. Although largely successful, his wars drained the treasury in return for small gains, and created many enemies abroad and at home. Manuel placated the merchant republics of Venice, Genoa, Almafi and Pisa, giving them extensive privileges in return for naval and political support. The rich trade republics bought their way into power, built large estates, and treated the local populace as second-class citizens, which aggravated the denizens of Constantinople, who despised the Latins. When Manuel died in 1180, he was succeeded by his 11-year-old son, Alexius II. But in reality, his Latin mother, Maria, the daughter of the crusader Prince of Antioch, Raymond of Poitiers, ruled as regent. Right away, she betrothed her son to the ten-year-old daughter of Louis VII, Agnes of France, 
and even gave more privileges to the Latin merchants, as the empire was now being attacked by Bela III of Hungary in the west and the Seljuk Turks in the east. Maria turned to her unlikely allies, the Pope and Saladin, but by that time it was too late. Maria Komnene, the emperor's half-sister, and her husband John were worried that Maria would continue her husband's pro-Latin policies, and they were the ones asking Hungary to attack. In 1182, they invited the exiled rebellious cousin of Manuel, Andronikos, to the capital. The latter sent his guards through the gates of Constantinople and urged the citizens to take justice into their own hands. Years of frustrations against the Catholics erupted in one of the most violent and bloody moments in the city's history, as tens of thousands of Latins were slaughtered in the quarters given to them. The mob even cut off the head of the papal legate Cardinal John. The 4,000 Westerners who barely survived the carnage were sold off to the Seljuks as slaves. Andronikos quickly turned on Maria Komnene and her husband, poisoning them. The usurper then forced the 13-year-old Alexius to sign the execution of his mother and proclaim him as co-emperor in front of the city crowd. Afterwards, Alexius was strangled, and the 65-year-old Andronikos married his betrothed Agnes of France, who was just 12. The new emperor wanted to undo the reforms of his predecessors, which were somewhat justified as they had now spiralled out of control and led to an unprecedented level of corruption. Andronikos forbade the sale of offices, appointed new and fair tax collectors, brutally punished corrupted officials, and reconciled with the Venetians, restoring trade relations disrupted by the killing of the Latins in 1182. While the people in the provinces enjoyed these new changes, the aristocracy and the populace of Constantinople, who were subjected to this new tyrannical government, quickly began conspiring against him. The city and the province of Philadelphia rebelled, but was then crushed, while Cyprus and Serbia made their own attempts to break off, which were successful. Srem, Zara, Zeman, Belgrade, Branicevo, Nis and Serdica were all seized by the joint Serbian-Hungarian army of Bela III and Stefan Nemanja with little to no resistance, and Regesa, which was previously the vassal of Constantinople, was forced to pledge allegiance to the Norman king of Sicily, William II. All of this happened in four separate campaigns, none of which saw a single pitched battle. The Byzantine army was paralyzed and in disarray. That same Norman king led an invasion against the Eastern Roman Empire on both land and sea, at the head of a massive army alongside a pretender who claimed to be Alexius II. He first conquered Dyrrhachium and the Ionian Islands in June of 1185, and then marched on the Egnatia Road to Thessaloniki unopposed, reaching it in August. At the same time, a fleet of 200 ships arrived under the walls of Thessaloniki. The great city was taken during the final assault in late August, which led to a brutal sack where 7,000 people died. On September 11th, 1185, while the emperor was absent from the capital, a popular uprising put a new candidate on the imperial throne, Isaac II Angelos. This caught Andronikos by surprise, and after he was captured, Isaac decided to let the mob deal with him. For three days, the former emperor was tied to a post and beaten. Then, the old emperor was executed in a horrific fashion, which marked the bloody end of the Komnenos dynasty, which both centralized and exhausted the state. Isaac II immediately turned his attention to the west and launched a campaign against the Norman invaders. A momentous event happened sometime during the campaign, as while the emperor was at camp, he granted audience to two brothers whose names were Assen and Theodore, who offered their help against the Normans in return for autonomy over territory in the Hamus Mountains. In response, the emperor's uncle, John Ducas, commanded a eunuch to slap the more insolent of the two in front of the emperor and sent them on their way back north. The conquest of Thessaloniki opened the road to Constantinople. 
but an army led by the general Alexius Rannus won two victories at Mosinopolis and then decisively on November 7th, 1185 at Demetritzis, largely due to the fact that the Norman soldiers lost discipline after extensive looting. Despite the fact that the Byzantines defeated the Norman land forces and retook most of the territory lost, the Norman navy continued to wreak havoc in the eastern Mediterranean and crushed a force sent by Isaac II to retake Cyprus. While Byzantium was busy with rebels and invaders from all sides, the two brothers previously insulted by the emperor's servant rebelled against the crown in one of history's most elaborate propaganda campaigns. The region of the Hamus Mountains, centered around the well-defended fortress of Tarnovo, was a multi-ethnic area with a mixed population made out of Bulgarians, Vlachs, Kumans and Pechenegs, as well as other semi-nomadic people driven out from the steppe. The brothers were most likely Vlachs, but to build a state, they tapped into Bulgarian heritage and culture, which not only endured, but flourished during 167 years of Byzantine control. Up to this point, the rich cattle herders of these lands were not directly involved in any conflict and remained loyal to Constantinople. To spread the flames of rebellion, the brothers rebranded themselves in the image of the great Bulgarian Tsars, changing their names from Theodore and Assen to Peter and Ivan Assen, with Peter crowning himself with a golden wreath, wearing red boots and claiming the throne for himself. Next, they took advantage of the recent sack of Thessaloniki, telling their supporters that the patron saint of the city, Saint Demetrius, had abandoned it and bestowed his blessing upon Tarnovo instead. One of his icons taken by the Normans made its way to the city and was placed in a hastily built wooden church. Peter and Assen declared their rebellion on his feast day of October 26, 1185, which was an important date in the calendar of all Orthodox Christians in the Balkans. Finally, they brought in soothsayers, who were people suffering from epilepsy but regarded as prophets, who told tales that additionally inspired people to rise up in rebellion. As the propaganda campaign was picking up speed, Isaac II levied a new tax that fell heavily on the people of the region, especially on the coastal cities of Varna and Ankylos, to pay for the wedding to the Hungarian princess, which was part of the terms of the peace he concluded with Bela III in order to secure the West. Bulgarian minor nobles, the boyars, were already aggravated due to losing their positions to the Byzantine aristocrats, and this tax pushed them to defect to the rebel cause. However, the rebellion lacked the means to take many of the nearby fortresses, including the old Bulgarian capital of Preslav, and quickly turned to raiding Thrace and gathering more support. Desperate for new allies, Isaac II offered the hand of his sister Theodora to Conrad of Montferrat, an ally of Manuel I, who distinguished himself fighting against Frederick Barbarossa in Italy in 1179. On his wedding day, he was also awarded the rank of Caesar. Shortly after, Alexius Vranus, the man who had crushed the Norman threat, was emboldened by his victories and the support of his men, who proclaimed him emperor in his native city of Adrianople. From there, he marched on Constantinople in the spring of 1187 and attempted to take the city. Despite some initial success, he was unable to breach the strong city defences, when suddenly Conrad rallied the defenders and sallied out with his Latin force. Alexius spotted the man and rushed over in an attempt to kill the enemy leader, but lost the jewel and his head. The rebellion was over and Conrad was a hero, but in the end he chose to board a Genoese ship and seek out more glory in the Holy Land, where he would play a key role in the Third Crusade. Vranes was a popular general among the local populace, so his killing by Conrad only exacerbated the animosity between the Latins and the Greeks. With the Vranus rebellion dealt with, Isaac II was ready to put an end to the raids of the north and marched against the Vlaco-Bulgarian rebels. The Byzantine astronomers knew that a total solar eclipse would happen on September 4, 1187, 
so Isaac used that to his advantage and attacked the moment the darkness set in. The unsuspecting rebels were decisively routed and forced to retreat north of the Danube. The emperor then took the capital with ease, taking Asin's wife Helen and brother Kalyan hostage, as well as recovering the icon of the patron saint. He then moved his army west to besiege Lovek, but this siege failed after three months. Despite the fact that the campaign was a military and symbolic victory, Angelos failed to capitalize on it since he left no garrison in Tarnovo, which the brothers quickly recovered with the help of their new Kuman allies. This forced Isaac to sign a peace treaty that recognized the establishment of the second Bulgarian Tsardom, but the hostilities were far from over. The Emperor took this time to uphold the promises of his predecessor towards the Venetians and even expanded their rights in return for their obedience. The Doge was named the most loyal servant of the Emperor, the Venetians regarded as Romans and forced to aid the Empire when called upon, in return for paying no tariffs when trading in all of its ports. Two years later, in 1189, the Venetian quarter was expanded by incorporating the smaller French and German quarters in the city in a treaty that named the trade ports Venice had free access to, one that would become the foundation of the partition of the Eastern Roman Empire 15 years later. On October 2nd, 1187, Saladin took over Jerusalem, which triggered the Third Crusade. Isaac II made an alliance with him to counterbalance Frederick Barbarossa, whose budding diplomacy with the Seljuk Turks was worrisome. After gathering at the initial starting point of Regensburg, the Crusaders passed Hungarian and Serbian lands, where they were treated with hospitality, and the Serbian ruler Stefan Nemanja proposed a coalition against Isaac along with the new Bulgarian state, who Serbia initially assisted. Frederick refused and sent envoys to Isaac. Unfortunately, the emperor was fighting against another pretender to the throne, Theodore Mankefes of Philadelphia, and his courtiers didn't think of anything better than taking the envoys hostage, which started a limited war between the Holy Roman and Eastern Roman empires. The Crusader journey in Byzantine lands was a series of hit-and-run attacks on their baggage train by Kumen, Vlach, Bulgarian, Serbian and Greek detachments. When captured, many admitted that they were acting on the orders of the Emperor. Mountain passes were blockaded, and the cities of Serdica and Philippopolis were found evacuated with their defences torn down. Meanwhile, Peter and Assen also sent a proposal to Barbarossa pledging their support and fealty if he would attack their common enemy an offer that Frederick seriously considered as he wintered at Adrianople for three months. From there he wrote to his son to gather a fleet of ships to aid in the capture of Constantinople, but that plan never panned out. In February of 1190, the Crusaders clashed with a vlaco cuman mercenary company hired by Byzantium and soundly defeated them near Arcadiopolis. Shortly after this defeat, Isaac II sent terms and concluded a treaty allowing the Crusaders past the strait free of charge. That same year, the Crusaders and the Seljuks of Rum would collide at the Battle of Iconium. Barbarossa was victorious and continued towards the Holy Land, which meant that neither him nor the Seljuks would trouble Isaac for the time being. Taking advantage of the absence of any Byzantine army, the Serbians sacked Skopje and occupied the region between Branicevo and Nis, but Isaac decided to deal with the fledgling Bulgarian state first. A major expedition was launched in July 1190, landing in Mesembria and heading straight to Preslav and Tarnovo, while enduring the typical guerrilla tactics employed by the locals. While preparing to capture Strinovos, a spy sent from Ivan Asen convinced Isaac II that a new Kuman wave was south of the Danube, ready to cut him off. The Emperor decided to move through the narrow Trievna Pass to avoid being stuck between two forces. The giant baggage train stretched four kilometers and the army was divided into three groups, the vanguard commanded by the Emperor's cousin, Manuel Kamitsis, and by his son-in-law, the Sebastokrator Isaac Komnenos. 
the main body of the army, under the command of the emperor and his brother, the Sebastocrator Alexios Angelos, and the rearguard, commanded by the emperor's uncle, John Ducas, the man who slapped Athen in the face. Knowing exactly when and where the enemy would be, Ivan Athen positioned his troops around the pass and allowed the vanguard to go through it, and then attacked the main corps under direct imperial command. Isaac could not deploy his troops. Once the battle ensued, the pinned Roman soldiers were showered with arrows and boulders from above. In order to get out alive, Isaac II's bodyguards had to cut through his own soldiers after he was injured and lost his helm. The Vlachs and the Bulgarians captured parts of the imperial treasury, including many religious relics. Upon learning about the attack, the rearguard used another pass, probably Shipka, through which John Ducas escaped. Yet another ambush that decimated the army and supplied the Bulgarians with weapons, armor, funds, morale, and above all, legitimacy. What followed was a whirlwind of conquests that included Varna, Ankylos, Serdica, Nis, all the way to Stob. And what was up until now a dual leadership from two brothers, with Peter at the helm, shifted with Ivan Asin I being the leading figure because of the military triumph. Back in Constantinople, Isaac II disguised his failure as a victory and energetically launched a new campaign against Serbia, crushing them somewhere on the Morava in 1191. There he accepted Stefan Nemanja as ruler of the region, as long as he was his vassal, forcing him to abandon all agreements with the Bulgarian brothers, and began contemplating a new attack, this time with the aid of Bela III, who would invade from the north, before Bulgaria could obtain the power and status it once had. In 1192, the emperor appointed one of his cousins, Konstantin Dukas Angelos, as Strategos, and gave him Philippopolis. That man proved his worth by securing several major victories and returning Thrace into the fold. Like many before him, his successes on the battlefield and the support of his men encouraged Constantine, who rose up in rebellion against Isaac. But when he wrote to his brother-in-law, who controlled Adrianople, to join his cause, he was refused, and the same supporters handed him over to the emperor, making his rebellion short-lived. With the capable defender now out of the picture, the Bulgarian raids resumed in 1194, now even more deadly thanks to the assistance of Kuman allies. Isaac II responded by bringing in Alexius Gidos from Asia Minor with fresh troops, combined with those of the West. That force was annihilated in Arcadiopolis, which was very close to Constantinople, and pushed the border between the two entities to the Rodope Mountains. Two expeditionary forces were sent to counterattack, both leading to a mutiny of the soldiers, who feared that their commanders would lead them to yet another mountain pass ambush. By this point, Isaac II was fed up with this small spark that only included Tarnovo and its countryside, which grew out of control, so he turned to Bela III and prepared for a massive invasion on two fronts. In March 1195, the emperor left the capital and gathered his force in Rodosto, where he received reports that there was a plot to put his brother on the throne. However, Isaac refused to believe that his brother would betray him. This was a mistake, as soon Alexius III proclaimed himself the emperor, blinding and imprisoning his brother and putting yet another campaign to a halt, which allowed the Bulgarians to press towards Melnik and Seris. Two new armies under two new commanders were sent against Bulgaria, both armies defeated and their commanders captured. However, what seemed to have been the greatest triumph of the new state quickly turned into a tragedy, as before the army reached Tarnovo, a Bulgarian noble killed Ivan Asin I. However, by that time, the second Bulgarian Tsardom was firmly established and became a major player in the region. Alexios III, who became emperor by blinding his brother, Isaac II, was one of the most inept rulers Constantinople ever saw, but at the same time he was one of the luckiest. In order to solidify his claim, he took the money gathered for military expeditions and spent it bribing the aristocracy. 
he made the sale of offices legal again, and despite his usurpation, had no interest in ruling, so he left the administration of the empire in the hands of corrupt officials and his wife Euphrosyne. Another Alexios, who pretended to be Manuel's son, dyed his hair, mimicked his stutter, and convinced the Seljuks he was the rightful heir to the throne. This started a war with the Seljuks, which weakened the Byzantines' hold over Anatolia. The diplomatic problems were mounting, and on Christmas 1196, Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI demanded a tribute of 1,600 pounds of gold, for which Alexios plundered the imperial tombs and raised a heavy tax on the empire. But just as the coin was collected, Henry died. Luckily for Alexios, the pretender was assassinated in 1197, which slowed down the Seljuk momentum. A big part of those funds were used to conclude peace with the Sultanate of Rum. The Byzantines' problems continued over the next few years. The coastal regions of the empire were pillaged by Genoan pirates, showing the weakness of the empire. The internal situation was also difficult, as in 1201, John Komnenos the Fat attempted to usurp the throne as his supporters chanted his name and burned down several churches, but that night a loyalist cut his head off, ending the coup. In the north, shortly after Ivan Asen I was assassinated, his brother Peter became the Tsar of Bulgaria, but also was assassinated soon after. The throne passed to their younger brother Kaya, who was a powerful military commander in his own right. The start of his reign was focused on obtaining legitimacy from the Pope, and after a lengthy correspondence, he received the title of king, in return for converting Bulgaria to Catholicism. To the west, a Serbian pretender rose to the throne with the aid of the Pope and Hungary, reducing the buffer zone, but the original Serbian monarch was restored with the aid of Bulgaria which showed that the second Bulgarian Tsardom was becoming a player in the region. The Pope who gave Kaoyan the title was Pope Innocent III, whose 18-year reign influenced every part of Christendom, and who was the man behind the pro-Catholic coup in Serbia in 1202. He excommunicated monarchs, annulled marriages, recovered central Italy and the Kingdom of Sicily from the Normans, involved himself in the Holy Roman Empire's succession crisis, created several holy orders, advocated for a crusade against the Cathars, and held a strict anti-Jewish policy. However, his greatest ambition was the recovery of Jerusalem. As the Third Crusade failed to retake Jerusalem, Innocent called for a new crusade in August 1198. It took more than a year before several French nobles took the cross. Their leader, Count of Champagne, Theobald III, was a 20-year-old energetic and charismatic man, related to English and French crowns, and he was soon joined by other powerful aristocrats like Count of Blois, Louis, Earl of Leicester, Simon of Montfort, and Renaud of Montmirail. By 1200, Theobald managed to recruit many knights from Flanders. However, the timing of this crusade could hardly be worse. Philip II of France was at war with John of England, and the Holy Roman Empire was in the middle of a succession war. Despite the lack of participants, the nobles remained hopeful and devised a very ambitious plan to retake the Holy Land. Egypt was the center of Muslim power, and with Saladin dead, the Crusaders would sail up the Nile, take Egypt, and march on Jerusalem from this new base. The goal of the Crusade was to retake Jerusalem, and to prevent desertion, so only the leadership knew this plan. The leaders sent envoys to the only city that had enough naval power to turn it into a reality. In February 1201, the leader of the Venetian Republic, Doge Enrico Dandolo, welcomed the envoys. This was the moment Venice was waiting for, a crusade that would give it wealth, allies, prestige, and above all, trade ports in the richest part of the Mediterranean. So two weeks later, the sides came to an agreement. 
Venice would halt all commercial enterprises for a year in an effort to build the best fleet in the world. While the Crusaders promised an army of 4,500 knights, 9,000 squires, and 20,000 footmen and crossbowmen, and agreed to pay the Venetians four marks for every horse and two silver marks for each man, which amounted to 85,000 marks. Additionally, the Venetians would supply the army with food for nine months and receive half of the plunder obtained on either land or sea. But then disaster struck. Theobald died of an unknown disease at the age of 22. For several months, the Crusaders sought out a new leader, but every noble they asked declined, until they reached out to Marquis of Montferrat, Boniface, whose wealth and name gave new life to the expedition, bringing in a wave of recruits, including knights from Italy and Burgundy. Still, the prolonged delay, death of the leader, general lack of interest due to regional conflicts, and the selection of a new leader who was Italian, while the majority of the Crusaders were French, eroded enthusiasm. Thousands of men sailed off from different ports directly to the Holy Land, and only 12,000 Crusaders showed up on the Venetian doorstep, a far cry from what was pledged. This angered the Venetians, who lost a year's worth of trade while working on the ships and supplies. The Crusaders also failed to come up with the silver they had promised. However, Dandolo proposed a solution. The Crusaders would loot the trade port of Zara, which Hungary took from Venice 20 years prior, and pay their debts with the spoils they would take. Thousands of Crusaders disliked this and left, but the majority agreed. This new plan appeased the Venetian council, and the 93-year-old blind doge gathered his people in St. Mark's Square in an effort to win their support. Signors, you are associated with the most worthy people in the world, and for the highest enterprise ever undertaken. I am a man old and feeble, who should have need of rest, and I am sick in body, but I see that no one could command and lead you like myself, who am your lord. If you will consent that I take the sign of the cross to guard and direct you, that my son remains in my place to guard the land, then I shall go to live or die with you and with the pilgrims. And when they heard him, they cried with one voice, We pray you by God that you consent and do it, that you come with us. With that speech, the crusade took a new form, with a new leader and tripled in number, as 20,000 Venetians joined it, at least a quarter of the population. Oarsmen, merchants and marines took the cross, and now outnumbered the other crusaders two to one. On October 1st, 1202, the fourth crusade departed for Zara, which was protected by high walls and a small harbor chain. The port fell instantly and the city was besieged. The defenders sent an envoy to the doge offering their surrender. The crusaders could plunder and take the city as long as the people were unharmed. Dandilo went to consult with his fellow crusaders first, but while he was away, members of the faction that didn't want to attack a Christian city and wanted to go to the Holy Land contacted the envoy. Why should you surrender your city? The pilgrims will not attack you, have no care of them. If you can defend yourselves against the Venetians, you will be safe enough. This message essentially ended the negotiations. Meanwhile, the doge and the nobles agreed to accept the surrender, and were stunned to find out the envoys were gone. To make matters worse, a papal envoy arrived, threatening anyone who attacked the city with excommunication. But it was too late to turn back now. The discord within the army was at an all-time high, as some camped further away from the city while the main force began firing their siege weapons at the walls and sent sappers to mine its towers. Five days later, the city surrendered under the same conditions as before, but already the cracks were showing, especially due to their excommunication. Winter had arrived, and the host courted in the rich city, with the Venetians taking the coastal side and the Crusaders taking the inland side, both of which were plundered. 
Three days after the occupation, a fight broke out within the city between the Venetian and Latin Crusaders. The battle engulfed Zara as steel clashed and crossbows were fired until the morning, leaving many dead on both sides, including some civilians. An uneasy truce was made between the Doge and the nobles, who desperately tried to keep the army from falling apart, which was particularly difficult with the absence of Boniface, who arrived two weeks later alongside a fresh German contingent and an envoy from King of Germany, Philip of Swabia. The latter was busy fighting over control of the Holy Roman Empire, but saw the opportunity to put his brother-in-law, Alexius IV Angelos, in charge of the East, and played a key role in convincing him to turn to the Crusaders for help. In our previous episode, we covered how the founder of the Angelos dynasty, Isaac II, was usurped by his brother, Alexios III, who blinded and imprisoned him alongside his son, Alexius IV. The latter was freed by peace and merchants, and was waiting for the right moment to free his father and retake the throne. He had heard of the financial struggles of the Crusaders, and offered them 200,000 silver marks. Additionally, he promised to either go alongside the Crusaders to the Holy Land, or send 10,000 men in his stead. But above all, he promised to put the Orthodox Church under the primacy of the Pope. Contemporary sources claim that the leaders of the Crusade were compelled to right the wrong done to Alexius IV because of their code of chivalry. Still, even more men deserted, and with Simon de Montfort going to the King of Hungary, most of the nobles who started the Crusade had either died or left. The Crusaders sent envoys to Pope Innocent III to obtain absolution, and requested that he allow the expedition to restore Alexius IV to the throne. Both were approved once Innocent III realized this was his best chance to end the East-West Schism. Once they celebrated Easter in April of 1203, the Venetians razed Zara and tore down its walls, before departing alongside Alexius IV. The fleet slowly made its way towards Constantinople, with Corfu, Andros and Abydos willingly opening their gates to the young Alexios. This slow crawl didn't go unnoticed by his uncle, Alexios III, who prepared the city's defences and rallied his people against the invaders. Unfortunately, there was nothing for him to do but wait, since none of the provinces sent reinforcements to the capital. The Byzantine fleet of the time was made up of 20 rotting galleys, which were stripped of anchors and sails by a corrupt official, so there was no way to counter the Crusaders. Unopposed, the Crusaders disembarked and made camp at Chalcedon and Scutari, with Constantinople on the horizon. The Emperor sent terms that were rejected, had smaller contingents harass their foraging parties, and gathered his army at Galata. With Boniface and Dandolo beside him, the young Emperor boarded a galley and revealed himself to the thousands of people gathered on the city walls, but none cheered for him, so the Crusaders prepared for battle. On July 5, 1203, the Venetians manned the ships, while the Crusaders formed seven divisions, each led by one of the leaders. Alexius III was in a perfect position to defend his shores, but he was up against the biggest amphibious assault force in medieval history. The specially designed Venetian troop transports unleashed the heavy knights, their charge covered by archers and crossbowmen. The first wave allowed for the infantry to safely make their way to the beach and put more pressure on the defenders. As soon as the lances were lowered, the Byzantines began to flee to the fortress of Galata. With the beachhead secure, the knights mounted their horses and made their way to the imperial tents and pavilions, which were abandoned, leaving many spoils behind. In order to access the Golden Horn, the massive chain had to be removed, and to do that, Galata had to fall, and so another siege began. It is here we see the first sign of resistance, as the defenders rushed out of the gates in an attempt to surprise the enemy. However, the Byzantine force was no match for the highly disciplined crusaders, 
who pushed them back and managed to get to the gate before it was closed. Galata was stormed, while many defenders were cut down or drowned. The chain was broken, and the Crusaders were one step closer to achieving their goal. A city of 350,000, Constantinople had around 15,000 men ready to defend it, of which 5,000 were Varangian guards. It had great walls and had seen many invaders come and go over the centuries. The sea wall, however, was its weak spot, one the Venetians were ready to exploit, tying scaling ladders to their masts as they loaded up their mangonels. Meanwhile, the Crusaders landed further down the Golden Horn, before camping outside the northwestern tip of the city. The camp was defended by palisades and constantly harassed by Byzantine troops that rushed out of the gates to inflict minor casualties, a strategy that proved very unsuccessful. During one of these sallies, the Burgundian division broke the attackers and chased them back to the walls, inflicting heavy casualties. After 10 days of skirmishes and preparation, the assault of the city began on the 17th of July, 1203. Half of the Crusader force mounted scaling ladders and finally met their match as they clashed with the notorious Varangians. Sword met the axe, and in the end, the Norsemen gained the upper hand, forcing the Latins to withdraw back to their camp. As the Crusaders pressed the defenders, the Venetian fleet engaged the other side of the city across the sea walls. Despite their siege ladders, mangonels and cover fire, they made little progress. Then suddenly the old doge disembarked on the coast in front of the walls, rallying his people with the banner of their patron saint, Mark, in his hands. Emboldened by this act of bravery, the Venetians rushed forward, taking tower after tower. The defenders were overwhelmed and began to flee, while the marines took 25 of the 103 towers across the walls. The Byzantines attempted to dislodge them, but the Venetians lit a massive fire that engulfed the city and prevented any counterattack. As the sea walls fell, Alexius III gathered all of his forces and rode out to meet the Crusaders head on. Seeing this, the Crusaders formed up behind their defences, ready to meet their numerically superior foe. The Latins formed up in good order, with archers and crossbowmen in front of the knights. Even the camp followers joined in, donning horse quilts and copper cooking pots for protection. The leaders ordered their men to take no action without a formal command, fearing desperate acts of heroism or retreat. Some would later write that it felt as if a huge wave was about to come crashing down on them. But Alexius III froze, and he and his army halted their movement, waiting for the enemy to make the first move. Hearing of this standoff, the doge commanded his men to retreat from the walls and go to aid their allies. He was the first to disembark on the coast, soon joined by his warriors. We're not sure what happened, but it seems that seeing the Venetians approaching the area, Alexius ordered a full retreat. That night, he stole 1,000 pounds of gold from the treasury and fled to Thrace. After almost a decade of being imprisoned, blinded Isaac II was dragged out of his cell and dressed in purple by the desperate citizens. The Crusaders sent envoys to negotiate with Isaac, and he received them well. The promises made by his son were confirmed. Immediately after, the Crusaders entered the city with Alexius IV, who was welcomed with open arms by the people who had recently refused him. There was a great feast and a coronation that made him co-emperor. In order to prevent another clash with the local populace, the Crusaders stationed themselves in Galata, where soon after his coronation, Alexios IV arrived. He was well aware that the original agreement the Crusaders made with Venice expired on September 29th, and found it difficult to gather the 200,000 marks he promised. So he asked for the term to be extended and for the Catholics to winter in his land until March, which would give him time to collect the funds. Additionally, he asked for Latin aid in vanquishing his uncle in Thrace. 
once again the crusade was delayed, and many were unhappy with the situation. But the doge and other leaders convinced them that it would be pointless to leave empty-handed, only to winter in the Holy Lands. The crusaders agreed, and over half of them left to attack Alexius III, who was organizing resistance in Adrianople. The Latin Quarter in Constantinople was repopulated after the massacre of 1182, and while Alexius IV was away, a fight broke out between the Latin and Greek inhabitants of the city, as the latter decided to scapegoat the Latins. The struggle escalated to a massive fire that burned down a huge portion of the city, melting down churches and killing thousands as the Crusaders watched from the other side of the Golden Horn. Approximately 15,000 Latins made their way to Galata, where they joined the pilgrims seeking protection from the locals. The Emperor returned in November to a devastated Constantinople, with an empty treasury and furious populace. Alexius paid small installments of the promised payment, melting down precious church relics while feeding the crusaders at his doorstep. Discontent with his weak and blind leadership continued to increase, and a riot broke out in January 1204, which saw the co-emperors sending their relative, Alexios Motsouflos, to the crusaders for aid once more. The envoy used the discontent of the Varangian guard, who probably weren't paid and hated the crusaders. The guard was bribed, murdering the co-emperors, and brought the envoy to the throne as Alexius V. The new emperor renewed the hostilities by launching a preemptive strike on the crusaders, as he knew that they would soon attack him to avenge Isaac and Alexius IV. Giant wooden structures were to be built on top of the sea walls, making them more difficult to take. While the defences were strengthened, the Byzantines sent seven large ships filled with lumber, tow, resin and barrels, and directed them towards the Venetian fleet. The fire ships could very well have taken out a big portion of the Crusader navy, if not for the quick response from the Venetians, who managed to attach hooks to the approaching vessels, redirecting them away. This was the last time the Crusaders argued over departing to the Holy Land, as they discussed the situation. In the end, the murder and usurpation, broken promises, and 15,000 Latins who had fled their camp led to one clear decision. The Crusader forces would assault the city, and this time they would not do so to place some pretender on the throne, but to take it for themselves. In March 1204, the leadership laid out plans on how to divide the Eastern Roman Empire among them, and how to evenly distribute the spoils. Once that was confirmed, they decided to focus all of their efforts on the sea walls. On the 9th of April, the assault began, as the walls were scaled at dozens of different points along the northern side, but a strong wind made it difficult for the ships to disembark and many were left stranded between the Golden Horn and the sea walls. The defenders relentlessly shot volleys of arrows, bolts and rocks, and managed to repulse the attacks. Back in Galata, the defeated host made plans, and some suggested to readjust the strategy and strike from a different point. But the Venetians managed to convince them that there were no other options, arguing that if an attack was made further south on the walls, the currents would carry the fleet away. Instead, a decision was made to bind the galleys in pairs and build giant fighting platforms that would act as naval siege towers. Meanwhile, Alexios V camped just outside the city in an effort to draw the crusaders out, which only depleted the already weakened garrison. On April 12th, the second assault commenced, and two of the largest ships in the fleet bound together embraced one of the towers. Elsewhere a small contingent, armed with pickaxes, made way to the walls. The defenders tried everything to stop them, but the armour and shields blocked most of the projectiles, allowing for a small gap to be opened in the wall. Knights crawled through the gap and held their ground against the waves of Greeks trying to stop them. At this point, the Varangians, who still weren't paid, decided to desert, 
leaving the Queen of Cities to fall. Rather than overextend, the Crusaders consolidated their position. Dandolo remained on the ships, Count Baldwin took the scarlet tent that Alexius V abandoned, while his brother, Henry, took the Blackenai Palace and Boniface camped within the city. In anticipation of a midnight attack, the latter group started a fire within the city, which was carried further inward by the wind and burned for nearly 24 hours. As his final attempt to rally the defenders failed, Alexius V fled to the west. When the fire burned out, there was no resistance left, no leadership, no Varangian guard, and no empire. One of the leaders of the crusade, the Marquis of Montferrat, Boniface, took the palace of Bucolion, where he found all the prominent ladies of the court. Count Baldwin of Flanders took quarters in the palace of Blackenay, while the doge Enrico Dandolo occupied the Hagia Sophia. Alexios III had left with the entire treasury, and the crusaders were determined to receive what they were promised by Alexius IV. But having learned their lesson from the infighting that occurred over spoils in Zara, they laid out a plan on how to sack the city. The citizens were not to be harmed, especially if they were Latins, and all the gathered spoils would be collected in designated piles within several churches, and then divided equally, half going to the Venetians and the second half to the Crusaders. Every major leader condemned acts of violence and selfishness under the threat of excommunication. Despite these clear instructions, many men turned to savages as they took spoils for themselves, while raping and killing innocent citizens. One particular episode describes a knight carrying loot on his shield stacked up to his chin. That knight and many others were hanged immediately. One of the primary contemporary chroniclers, Nikitas Konietis, describes an event from which we can draw several conclusions. As he and his wife were attempting to leave the city five days after it fell, they saw a young girl who was grabbed by a knight and dragged through the streets until he barred the door of his newfound home with her inside. The act was reported to other knights nearby, who immediately threatened him with death if he did not release the girl, at which point he obeyed. Yet again we see the division in the Crusader camp, with some choosing to disobey direct orders, but most following them out of discipline, oaths or fear. But while they did their best to limit violence, their greed rolled over the city, destroying artifacts, monuments and works of art. The imperial treasury was empty, so the crusaders began stripping metal ornaments, ivory containers, pearls and precious stones, melted down chalices and relics, plundered churches, and the stone homes of the rich, which were left exposed by the fire after it devoured the timber houses of the commoners. Around half of the population of the city was left homeless and became refugees, making their way to Bulgaria and the new successor states. The Church of the Holy Apostles, also known as the Imperial Cemetery, which for more than 700 years was the second most important church in the city, was already ransacked by Alexios III when he was gathering a tribute that was demanded of him from the Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI, but that did not stop the Crusaders from breaking into the sarcophagi of the buried emperors, including Constantine, Justinian and Theodora, Heraclius and many others. The invaders were surprised to find Justinian's body still intact, with no signs of rot. The bodies themselves were untouched, but the precious objects Alexius III didn't dare to touch were taken to the pile of spoils. Every church was ransacked, including the great Hagia Sophia, with its great golden altar, engraved with the colours of 72 pearls, cut into pieces and carted off on mules. The heavy load and slippery marble floor caused some of the animals to slip and fall, and before long, the floor of the temple was covered in blood and excrements. The empire was dead, and now the vultures were dismembering its corpse. Countless marble statues and columns were shipped off and sold. The harbour chain that protected the Golden Horn was separated into pieces and delivered to Acre alongside the very gates of the city. Doors, furniture, silk, and other valuables were also sold or sent back to the west. 
the Catholics found no interest in icons, which were not nearly as popular in the Catholic world, so they destroyed or desecrated a vast quantity of them to the dismay of the local populace. And yet, the biggest tragedy was what they did to the numerous bronze works of art throughout the city. Giant statues, symbolizing authority, beauty, strength and wisdom, were thrown into the smelters and melted down to be turned into cheap copper coins. Among them were a statue of Hera, charioteers, a man wrestling with a lion, a monument celebrating Actium, a statue of Aphrodite being handed the golden apple of discord by Paris of Troy, a bronze statue of the she-wolf suckling the founders of Rome, a tetrapylon built by Theodosius with a beautiful facade that depicted birds, sheep, lamb, fish, as well as mythological creatures and figures, with a large bronze pyramid and a female figure that acted as a weather vane showing the direction of the wind. This is just the beginning of the list. Among the lost cultural items was a crocodile with prickly bronze scales clutching a struggling African buffalo in its jaws. The Nile bull, as the locals called it, attempted to break free by biting the crocodile, both killing each other in the process, neither achieving its goal. Another smelted art piece was a large statue that stood at the base of the Forum of Theodosius, depicting the hero of the ancient Greek myth Bellerophon as he gazed towards the sun, riding the winged Pegasus, alongside a large bronze eagle with extended wings and a coiled snake in its claws. The latter also served as a sundial, with its wings split into 12 sections, from which the observer could determine the hour of the day. Also lost was a massive bronze sculpture made by the legendary Lysippos, the personal sculptor of Alexander the Great, whose pupil constructed the Colossus of Rhodes. Lysippos created a giant Heracles with a lion skin over him and a club in his hands. His shin was as tall as a man, and a man's belt could go around his thumb. The masterpiece was cut piece by piece and thrown into the fire like all the rest. Sphinxes, sea monsters, and other mythological creatures were also destroyed. For the description of the last notable statue, we turn to the contemporary chronicler. What of the white-armed, beautiful-ankled, and long-necked Helen, who mustered the entire host of the Hellenes and overthrew Troy, whence she sailed to the Nile, and after a long absence, returned to the abodes of the Laconians? Was she able to placate the implacable? Was she able to soften those men whose hearts were made of iron? On the contrary, she who had enslaved every onlooker with her beauty was wholly unable to achieve this, even though she was apparelled ornately. Though fashioned of bronze, she appeared as fresh as the morning dew, anointed with the moistness of erotic love on her garment, veil, diadem, and braid of hair. Her vesture was finer than spiderwebs, and the veil was cunningly wrought in its place. The diadem of gold and precious stones which bound the forehead was radiant, and the braid of hair that extended down to her knees, flowing down and blowing in the breeze, was bound tightly in the back with a hairband. The lips were like flower cups, slightly parted as though she were about to speak. The graceful smile, at once greeting the spectator, filled him with delight. Her flashing eyes, her arched eyebrows, and the shapeliness of the rest of her body were such that they cannot be described in words and depicted for future generations. O oh, Helen, Tyndarius's daughter, the very essence of loveliness, offshoot of Erites, ward of Aphrodite, nature's most perfect gift, the contested prize of Trojans and Hellenes, where is your drag granted you by Thon's wife, which banishes pain and sorrow, and brings forgetfulness of every ill? Where are your irresistible love charms? Why did you not make use of these now as you did long ago? But I suspect that the fates had ordained that you should succumb to the flame's fervor, so that your image should no longer arouse spectators' sexual passions. It is said that these Anadae condemned you to the flames as retribution for Troy's having been laid waste by the firebrand because of your scandalous amours. But the gold madness of these men does not allow me to conceive and utter such a thing, for that madness was the reason why rare and excellent works of art everywhere were given over to total destruction. 
Considering the extensive list of art that was present all over the city, in the Forum, Hippodrome, overlooking the streets and churches, it's easy to see why the citizens of the Empire considered themselves Roman. The Fourth Crusade didn't just demolish monuments, it struck a blow against their identity, severing their ties with antiquity. One of the few bronze works of art that were not thrown into the smelters was the Quadriga. These were four life-sized bronze gilded horses, originally sat on the top of Hadrian's mausoleum before they were moved to the Hippodrome. The Venetians took these horses, cut off their heads and transported them to Venice, where they were reassembled and put on top of the St. Mark church, with collars on their neck to hide the cut. The brilliant works of art overlooked the city until history once again repeated itself. Napoleon took control of Venice in 1797 and forcibly removed the statues, along with an immense quantity of art from all over Italy. Yet again, gold and silver objects were melted down to pay for soldiers' salaries, but the Chariot of the Gods was placed on top of the newly commissioned Arc de Triomphe before it was returned to Venice following the Congress of Vienna. Along with the horses, St. Mark's Basilica was decorated with the Carmignola, four life-size sculptures of the Tetrarchs, and marvellous pillars of Acre. Additionally, Venice also sees the Colossus of Barletta, a massive bronze statue of either Marcian or Leo I, which washed up on the beach of Barletta after the ship that carried it sank. This clearly shows that unlike the rest of the Crusaders, the Venetians preferred to preserve the bronze statues rather than smelt them and turn them into coins. One theory suggests that the reason behind this was that the Franks considered the great bronze statues to glorify polytheism, making them go out of their way to destroy them for very little monetary gain. But Venice was not the only one that got to bring trophies home. Over the next few decades, many artifacts were shipped off to the west. The head relics and bones of multiple patriarchs and saints, including Andrew, the patron saint of Constantinople, were taken by various cardinals and clergymen. Conrad of Krosig, Bishop of Halberstadt, was one of the crusaders who sacked the city, and a year later he returned home, enriching his cathedral with several precious artifacts. The blood of Christ, a strand of the Virgin Mary's hair, pieces of the true cross, the crown of thorns, his purple robe, and his sandals, along with other objects attributed to various apostles and saints, several gold discs, and two ivory panels. Traditionally, splinters of the true cross were stored in special precious containers, which the Crusaders scattered to Limburg, Trier, Koblenz, Amiens, and Rome, with the largest of them going to Paris. The French city also obtained the mysterious Shroud of Turin, bearing the negative image of a man, leading many to believe that this was the burial shroud that Jesus was wrapped in. Paris received many other great artifacts, a majority of which were destroyed during the French Revolution centuries later. Robert of Clary was a low-born French knight who provided us with a glimpse of the treasures that were lost to us. Not even one person above earth, as much as he had lived in this city, would be able to count and tell the riches, because whoever narrated even the slightest about this wealth, about the beauty and precious things that were found in the monasteries, churches and palaces, and in the city, would appear a liar and not one would believe him. Another account of one of the leaders of the crusade tells us how the great heaps of spoils were split in half, with the crusaders receiving 150,000, of which 50,000 went to Venice, alongside their own share of 150,000 marks. But this figure does not account for all the precious treasures that were destroyed, melted, sold or shipped off. In reality, this was arguably the greatest loss of art in human history. When the Western Roman Empire fell, Constantinople became a bastion of knowledge and art, keeping the secrets of both behind its tall walls. The Fourth Crusade opened those walls and spread the spoils all over Western Europe, arguably setting the foundation of the Renaissance. The stone and marble statues were cut, the bronze marvels smelted, the churches and palaces were plundered, 
and now the Crusaders were preparing to divide the land and elect the first emperor of this new Latin Empire to spread their reign over the remnants of the shattered Roman one. The Latin Empire, as we know it today, is a historiographical name, as the Crusaders considered themselves the direct successors to the Roman Empire and continued to call it Imperii Romani. They kept the customs, the bureaucratic systems, and the local government intact in an attempt to win over the local population. This came as a great surprise to the Holy Roman Emperor, as for centuries the East and West argued over the title of Emperor, a dispute which did not end with the dissolution of the Empire itself. The two most fundamental changes enacted by the new regime were the creation of the Latin Patriarchate of Constantinople and the introduction of Western feudalism. Despite his excommunications and outrage at the sack of Constantinople, Pope Innocent III was eager to end the East-West Schism and sent out a Venetian, Tommaso Morosini, who became the first Patriarch of Constantinople. Still, Catholic influence did not extend beyond the city itself, which continued to have a strong Orthodox clergy. There was no persecution or forced conversion, as the Crusaders desperately tried to win over the vast population. As for the feudal structure of the Latin Empire, one can view that change as a continuation of the reforms started by the Komnenos dynasty, only even more complicated. The empire was divided into fiefs, with vassal lords swearing fealty to the emperor, who controlled a quarter of the imperial territories and city, while the other three quarters were divided between the Crusaders and Venetians. The Venetian doge, Enrico Dandolo, was officially recognized as ruler of one quarter and half of the Roman Empire, was granted Hagia Sophia and was the only one who didn't have to swear allegiance to the emperor. The rest of the Crusaders were direct vassals, ruling vast lands at least in name, since nearly all of the lands they claimed were unconquered. In fact, the Emperor considered Bulgaria, Nicaea and Trebizond not as enemies he had to vanquish, but rebels who defied his rightful claim. As for the Emperor himself, the crown was originally offered to the old and blind Enrico Dandolo, but keeping with the principles of the Republic, the Doge declined. Afterwards, a council of twelve electors, six Venetians and six Crusaders, was formed. In the end, it was a tie between two candidates, Boniface of Montferrat and Baldwin of Flanders. The Venetians, who had the decisive vote, picked the latter candidate, as they were worried that Boniface might favour the Genoans, who were close to his homeland. Boniface did not take the loss well, and demanded that he receive the second city in the empire, Thessaloniki, as well as the already promised islands of Euboea and Crete, to which the new emperor agreed. A month after the city fell, Baldwin was crowned, and soon his forces spilled out in all directions to solidify their feudal claims. City after city surrendered to them, and had Latin garrisons installed, but it was not long before tensions escalated. Baldwin suddenly changed his mind and took Kavala and Thessaloniki himself, while Boniface took up arms against him, seized Vivimortico and began attracting the locals, who preferred him due to the fact he already married the former wife of Isaac II, Margaret of Hungary. Next, he laid siege to Adrianople, but by that time, the rest of the Crusaders received word of the conflict and sent messengers to both men in an effort to restore the peace. Realizing their struggle would mean the end of their new empire, Baldwin reaffirmed and expanded the rights of Boniface, who became the King of Thessalonica. While no blood was spilled, the Crusaders showed weakness, and the locals immediately sent out letters to their old enemy, Kalyan of Bulgaria, who shared their hatred, and promised him the crown if he saved them from the Crusaders. This pact was solidified by none other than the Patriarch of Constantinople, who had taken refuge in Vivimortico. The previous year, Kalyan reached out to the Crusaders and offered his help, 
but they scolded him, replying that he should address them not as equals, but as a servant addressing his master. The king was furious, not only at the insult, but at the fact that he spent years placating the pope to receive his crown and insignia, while a simple count without either was elevated to emperor, which was the original goal of the Assen dynasty. Baldwin solidified his rule over Thrace and found Alexios V. The new emperor used this opportunity to solidify his legitimacy, so he raised him on top of a tall marble column in the middle of the Hippodrome and made the entire city of Constantinople watch their last emperor fall to his death. In the east, the emperor's brother, Henry, advanced on Lepadium and Adramitium, which fell without resistance. But then suddenly he was ambushed by forces of one of the Byzantine pretenders, Theodore Mancaphus of Philadelphia. However, the sight of the heavily armoured knights and their lances prevented his men from taking any action, and they were decisively routed, despite their superior numbers. That humiliating defeat ended the first successor state, which was absorbed by Theodore Lascaris of Nicaea, who used the weakness of his rival to expand his own claim. The other contender to the throne, David Komnenos of Trebizond, who was able to take over his ancestral homeland with the help of the Queen of Georgia, Tamar the Great, moved his forces to occupy Nicomedia, soon realizing that in this conflict, religion, culture and allegiances constantly shifted as Theodore Lascaris moved his troops through a secret pass, outmaneuvering the forces of Trebizond. David Komnenos was caught off guard, but the timely action of the Latins, who came to rescue the city, forced both successor states to abandon their campaigns. One of the most important aspects of the regional struggle was the fact that the Crusaders were very few in numbers, and in order to keep the empire from falling apart, Baldwin gave huge concessions to the locals and his allies, but this meant that the Latins could not afford any drastic changes in command or signs of weakness. Kalyan finally decided to act, and sent 5,000 Greeks to rebel against the Latins. The first cities to rebel were Adrianople and Vivimotico, and their garrisons were killed. Most of the Crusaders were either in Greece or Asia Minor, spread even thinner, but since Nicaea and Trebizond were busy fighting each other, Baldwin managed to recall his men from the east to deal with this new threat. Most of the Philippopolis defenders also tried to unite with the main host, but were intercepted and slaughtered. On March 25th, 1205, Emperor Baldwin, Doge Dandolo, and Louis of Blois marched to Adrianople. We don't have a concrete number for the crusading army, but it had around 5,000 troops, among them around 1,000 horsemen and 300 knights. Upon approaching the city, they began constructing siege weapons and digging tunnels underneath the walls, which were flying Bulgarian banners. The crusaders wanted to deal with this threat before Kalyan could arrive, so they were disorganized, coming in waves, and very short on supplies. Some of them attempted to assault a nearby castle and raid its stores, but were unsuccessful. On April 13th, Kalyan arrived with a large army that included many Kuman horsemen. Once again, the number of troops Kalyan had is disputed, with the crusader chronicler Geoffrey of Villardin claiming that they had around 50,000, while modern historians think that the number was around 8,000. The Bulgarians camped eight kilometers away from the city and sent a contingent of Kuman horse archers to harass the grazing sheep and horses. Mounted knights gave chase and tried to retaliate, but the lightly armored Kumans gave them a taste of the feigned retreat tactic which a certain Mongol warlord was preparing to unleash on the other side of the world. Taking light casualties in their unsuccessful attempt, the knights returned to the camp. That night, all of the leaders gathered for a war council, and the emperor ordered that no man should chase after the enemy. Instead, the army was to form lines and hold their formation. On the next day, 
After studying the path the small contingents of knights chose to follow, the Bulgarians gambled that they would repeat their mistake, and positioned their troops in an ambush at a narrow corridor between the Tunja River and a forested hill, and dug out pits in the middle, which were concealed. This time, the Kumans aimed at the tents where many crusaders were having lunch. Despite the direct orders, one of the most notable crusaders, Louis of Blois, gathered his men and charged at the light cavalry. The man was regarded as a capable commander and hungered for glory, and it's also important to remember that up until this moment, the crusaders hadn't lost an open battle and made an entire empire fall to its knees. Seeing one of the first nobles who took the cross ride out to certain doom, Baldwin rallied his troops and tried to aid his commander. The crusaders proceeded to mount their horses in total disarray and follow after the Cumans while the Venetians continued the siege. Occasionally, the Cumans would turn around and fire at their horses, letting them close the distance before they galloped further into the valley, until eventually reaching the trap, where the rest of the Bulgarian army awaited the Crusader force. The Bulgarians rushed in from both sides, while more Cumans wheeled around to block any withdrawal. The heavily armoured knights were encircled and taken down from their horses, their necks exposed to knives and nooses, or smashed by blunt weapons. While the Crusaders were few in number, they represented the best the West had to offer. Still, Count Louis and around 300 knights perished that day along with an equal number of mounted sergeants. Emperor Baldwin refused to flee and was captured by the Bulgarian force. The feudal system of the new Latin Empire was entirely broken with a single stroke, but Kalyan wanted to finish the job. He and his men rode out towards the main crusader camp, which was ready to meet them, now commanded by the Marshal of the Empire, Geoffrey of Villardin. After a long stare down and the occasional arrow volley, the crusaders' discipline did not fail and the Bulgarians withdrew back to their camp for the night. Knowing that they would be assaulted the following day, the crusaders lit many torches and quietly left the area before either side realized what was happening. Kalyan was surprised to find the camp deserted and sent his scouts to locate the enemy, but to no avail. He then stood at the gates of Adrianople, awaiting to be received by the citizens as their emperor. But history took a dramatic shift as the Greeks refused to open their gates. Despite their promises and careful planning, the key center Kalyan needed to take on the road to the throne defied him and he transformed into the mad Tsar. Baldwin's brother Henry was at that point returning from his victory over Theodore Mancafus in Asia Minor. He had 20,000 Armenian men, women and children who sided with him and thus drew the ire of the Greeks. Hearing of the defeat at Adrianople, Henry rushed with his troops to Thrace, leaving the civilians to their fate. According to the sources, they were slaughtered by the locals. Meanwhile, Kalyan turned west and seized Ceres and laid siege to it in late May. The city fell, but the citadel was hard to penetrate. The defenders offered their surrender if they were allowed safe passage. Although Kalyan accepted this, he then executed them. Next came the cities of Veria and Almopia, which were razed to the ground and their populace relocated. Kalyan was here to destroy, not conquer, and before long he would take the nickname Roman Slayer. Unlike Basil II the Bulgar Slayer, who received his nickname long after his death, Kalyan not only knew his title, but lived up to it, raising the city of Philippopolis on the way back to Tarnovo. After the crusaders who survived Adrianople reached Rodosto, they were joined by Henry's host, alongside the garrisons that managed to escape Kalyan's wrath. The fate of Emperor Baldwin was unknown, with some thinking that he died of his wounds. We also have sources claiming that he would be a prisoner in Tarnovo where Kalyan tortured him to death. In any case, the situation looked bleak, and 7,000 of them decided to abandon the empire and sail back home, 
most of them Venetians. That same month, the 98-year-old Doge Enrico Dandolo died and was buried in Hagia Sophia. The Republic would vote whether to move their capital to Constantinople, but in the end, their commercial interests outweighed their political ones, and Venice would slowly shift its focus elsewhere. Henry was appointed as regent in the absence of Baldwin. He attempted to take Adrianople, but failed. His attempt to take Vivimotico was also unsuccessful, as he lost his siege equipment to a flood. Henry might have hoped to get the help of Boniface, but the latter was busy laying siege to Nafplio. As a result, the Crusaders just didn't have enough troops to defend any of their territories. All of Thrace, except for Rodosto and Salimbria, rebelled or had been sacked, with only Biga under control on the other side of the channel. In January 1206, Kaoyan launched a new campaign, this time even more devastating than the last. As the Crusaders were still reeling from their loss, Kaoyan and his Cumans managed to destroy over a dozen major settlements, the cities reduced to ash, with their populace and cattle moved back to Bulgaria. One particularly brutal episode was the destruction of the great port city of Rodosto, where many panicked at the mere sight of the Roman slayer. So many Venetians jumped on their ships that many of them sank before the city fell and was destroyed like all the rest. As the Crusaders were moving men from one garrison to another, they were discovered by the Bulgarian force and had to accept battle near Rusion. Several thousand men, along with over a hundred knights, fought 7,000 Bulgarians. The Crusaders were soundly defeated as they crawled towards the safety of the nearby fortress, where all the defenders could do was watch as some of the best warriors were cut down. Following this campaign, the few remaining Greeks abandoned their own interests and sided with the Latins out of fear of the Roman slayer and cooperated with Henry. Once he learned of this, Kaoyan immediately laid siege to Vivimotico and razed it to the ground. The newly crowned Emperor Henry gave chase and after a short skirmish pushed back the Bulgarians, who left 20,000 men, women and children, carrying their belongings on over 3,000 wagons from the razed city. Henry rejoiced as he managed to save the citizens of at least one of the destroyed cities, but this gives us an idea of the level of devastation Thrace suffered. The Eastern Roman Empire lost battles and lands before, but it was these events that left a scar that would never heal. Henry proceeded to return the favour by raising Thermopolis and Ankylos and several other Black Sea cities before returning to Adrianople. While the Crusaders were losing their positions in Thrace and Asia Minor, Theodore Lascaris of Nicaea turned his sights on Phrygia, defeating the claimant and splitting his lands with the Seljuk Sultan. Within the span of a year, Nicaea became the dominant power in the region, consolidating the lands of two other claimants and stopping the advance of a third. At the beginning of 1207, Lascaris proposed a joint attack on Constantinople, which Kaoyan gladly accepted and began by laying siege to Adrianople with 33 trebuchets in April 1207. The defenders desperately tried to repair the damaged walls, and once a breach was made, they built a wooden palisade behind it and dug a trench in front of it as the Bulgarians started pouring in. The wall was set ablaze, and this forced the attackers to withdraw. After a month, Kaoyan lifted the siege. Henry also fought off the Nicaeans, successfully leading to a truce, which ceded some territory so he could focus on the bigger threat in the west. Meanwhile, Boniface was still in Greece, where the tendency for lands which were under control of the empire and not some local noble to willingly surrender at the sight of the Crusader army continued. King Boniface already had a son with his queen Margaret, named Demetrius, and thousands of Greeks joined him at the sight of the small boy, which they believed was their future emperor. A powerful noble, Leo Sogoros, who took control of a portion of the northern Peloponnese, 
prepared to make a stand at the Pass of Thermopylae, like his ancestors before him, before losing his courage at the approach of the armoured knights. At the same time, the Despotate of Epirus, controlled by Michael Comnenus Ducas, chose the diplomatic approach. The city of Dyrrhachium was lost to Venice, which also managed to take Corfu from Genoa in 1207, but the Republic was not interested in the rest of the country, which was at least on paper their domain. So Michael simultaneously swore fealty to Boniface instead of Baldwin and corresponded with the Pope, promising to accept Catholicism in return for protection. In reality, Michael was transforming his state into a safe haven for loyalists who wanted to escape the Latins and ransomed Alexios III after he was captured by Baldwin. The Peloponnese was invaded from the north and south, as many crusaders who kept their vows and sailed to the Holy Lands from other ports now came towards Greece looking for land and glory. Even with complete naval supremacy, southern Greece was hard to conquer because of its many fortresses and mountainous terrain. All of that changed when the locals decided to meet the crusaders in battle, outnumbering them five to one where once again the Crusaders were victorious. The Battle of the Olive Grove is sometimes described as the Hastings of Morea. Afterwards, nearly all of it surrendered, apart from Naplio, Corinth, Argos and Laconia, who managed to resist for a few more years. After failing to move north into Bulgarian territory, Henry met up with Boniface in Kipsela to plan a joint attack against Kaoyan, but on the way back to Thessaloniki, Boniface was killed in an ambush and his head was sent to Kayan. The Bulgarians immediately made their way back into the city, ready to destroy the kingdom. But the day before the planned assault, a man snuck into Kayan's tent and stabbed him with a spear. He was the last of the three brothers to be assassinated and for a brief moment amidst the chaos, both Latins and Greeks were relieved as the army went home. The assassination of Kaoyan managed to halt the avalanche of Bulgarian conquests against the Latins. However, the Kingdom of Thessaloniki, which was more powerful than the empire itself, faced another crisis. In an attempt to win over the local populace, Boniface favoured his infant son Demetrius, who was seen as more legitimate since his mother, Margaret of Hungary, was a former Byzantine empress. When Boniface died, the kingdom passed not to his eldest son William, but his newborn, with Margaret acting as regent. This, however, angered the Lombard lords, who held fiefs in his name all over Greece, and they rebelled. Emperor Henry of Flanders tried to be lenient and called the nobles to Ravenica in May 1209 in an attempt to resolve this issue, but most of them didn't show up. A two-year war ensued, ending with an uneasy peace as the rebel nobles and their Templar supporters were defeated. Many were starting to see that this new Latin Empire was unlikely to last, and while they swore oaths of fealty to Henry instead of the new Kingdom of Thessalonica, ruled by an infant boy, most lords were only after their own self-interest. The Principality of Morea and Despotate of Epirus were vassals of the Latin Empire, but that same year they became vassals of the Republic of Venice as well, granting them generous trade rights in all of their cities. Despot of Epirus, Michael I Comnenus Ducas, in particular, was trying to play each side, converting to Catholicism, but at the same time ransoming Alexius III from captivity in order to gain a claim to the throne. Meanwhile, the ruler of Nicaea, Theodore Wascaris, was desperately trying to enforce his own claim by annexing other successor states. After absorbing Phrygia and Philadelphia, Theodore allied with the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum and attacked the Empire of Trebizond, which was attempting to take Nicomedia from the Latins. The Empire of Trebizond was led by two Komnenoi brothers supported by Georgia, and despite having the best claim, they were forced to become vassals to Henry of Flanders in return for military aid in the form of 300 knights. 
the Nikian advance was stopped at Heraclea, and Trebizond responded by launching a punitive raid against the Adori Wascaris. However, the 300 Frankish knights separated from the main force and were soundly defeated in an ambush. The tides turned, and in 1208, Nikia took Heraclea, Kitoros, and Amastris in quick succession. On the European side of the Bosphorus, the Bulgarian throne was usurped by Kalyan's nephew, Boriu, who quickly married the Kuman queen, giving rise to the theory that the assassination and usurpation were both part of a pro-Kuman plot. This forced the legitimate heir, even Asan II, to flee from Tornovo and take refuge in the Principality of Halic at the age of 14. This disputed succession caused several nobles in Bulgaria to break off, including Boriu's cousin, Alexios Slav, who became the despot of a small realm in the southwest and received the backing of Emperor Henry. Boriu knew that he had to enforce his rule and decided to attack the Latins. He managed to surprise them by attacking the Latin camp near Beroe. There, the Latins took heavy casualties as a hail of arrows killed many of the knights who didn't get a chance to put on their armor. The Bulgarian cavalry attacked the flanks, and the emperor was caught by a lasso. But just as disaster was imminent, a knight cut off the rope and shielded his liege. Over the next 12 days, the Latins retreated to Philippopolis in good order, but still taking many casualties along the way. Finally, once they approached the city, Henry took a stand and formed up his line. Around 3,000 warriors remained several hundred of which were knights, against 30,000 Bulgarians, of which 7,000 were Kuman mounted archers. Boriu tried to mimic what his uncle had done at Adrianople three years prior, but this time the Crusader army did not fall for the trap. Marshal Geoffroy de Villardois used his heavy cavalry to repel a charge, and the open fields allowed the Latin cavalry to compensate for its small number and inflict heavy losses on the Kuman riders, who had trouble fighting in the summer heat. The day belonged to the Latins, but both sides took heavy casualties and hostilities ceased for a few years. After the military approach failed to give Boriu the stability he craved for, he attempted to consolidate his power by persecuting the Bogomus, summoning the Synod in Tornovo in 1211, where he personally led the debates against the heretics which were very similar to the Cathars in southern France, who were massacred in the Albigensian Crusade during the same period. That same year, Boriu managed to secure an alliance with one of the breakaway Bulgarian states under a man named Stres, and established an anti-Latin coalition made up of the despotates of Epirus, Stres and Nikia. Boriu and Stres launched a campaign against Thessaloniki and assaulted the city while Henry was fighting Nikaea but despot Michael changed sides once more to aid the Latins, and the Bulgarians were soundly defeated at the city. Meanwhile, the recently ransomed Alexius III wanted to make a comeback, and he allied with Seljuk Sultan Kekosra I, who had recently taken over Antalya. Together, they marched at the head of a large army, totaling around 10,000 against the Nicaeans, who brought 2,000 cavalry along with 800 mounted Latin mercenaries. The Seljuks laid siege to Antioch on the Meander, which was critical to the whole region. As soon as Theodore learned that the city was about to fall, he ordered a forced march, leaving the baggage train and carrying just a few days' rations in a desperate attempt to relieve the siege. Alexius III and the Sultan abandoned the siege and rode out to meet the enemy in a narrow valley where they couldn't deploy their full force. As soon as the two armies met, the Latin cavalry rushed into the enemy center, crushing many archers and slingers. It then pulled back and charged again, but this second charge was less deadly as the soldiers got into a formation, withstanding the charge before surrounding and slaughtering the Latins. The Seljuks kept on advancing, and at the edge of victory, Caecusra I scanned the battlefield, searching for Theodore Wascaris. The two rulers met, and Theodore was struck with a heavy blow by a mace and fell from his horse. The Sultan barked orders at his servants to carry the pretender away, 
but suddenly the Nikian Emperor cut down the rear leg of the horse and decapitated the Seljuk leader. His head was impaled on a lance, and the sight brought terror to the remaining army, which retreated back to Iconium. Nikea was victorious, but was unable to pursue the enemy as they had sustained heavy casualties themselves. The ultimate prize was the capture of Alexius III, who was stripped of his imperial insignia and spent the rest of his days in a monastery. This finally gave Wascaris the legitimacy he needed to claim the title, but there was a long road ahead. Henry did not underestimate the severity of this threat and used the opportunity to strike at Nicaea in October 1211. After a day-long battle, the Nicaeans could not defeat the heavily armoured knights, and Henry pushed as far as Nymphion. This successful campaign led to the Treaty of Nymphion, which solidified the Latin position on the coast of Propontis, as well as some islands, but ended their vassalage over the empire of Trebizond. The latter clause of the treaty meant that the Latins weren't protecting Trebizond anymore, a cunning move that allowed Wascaris to make up for the lost lands by annexing most of Paphlagonia. That same year, the Seljuks would take Sinope and kill David Komnenos, who led the defence of the city. Shortly after, his brother Alexius managed to retake it, but misfortune struck again as he was captured during a hunting expedition. The Emperor of Trebizond was then brought in front of the city walls and was tortured in the sight of its inhabitants until they opened the gates. Alexios was ransomed and the Empire of Trebizond became a vassal of the Seljuks. Despite the fact that Trebizond retook the Byzantine lands in Crimea, it would never again be a contender to the throne. The defeat at Philippopolis and Thessaloniki, along with the truce with Nicaea, ended Boreu's ambitions and he married his daughter Maria to Henry, while becoming his vassal and returning the lands Kalyan conquered in Thrace as her dowry. Bulgaria was once again in the sphere of influence of Constantinople and would be inherited by Henry's heir. Boreu continued his diplomacy by marrying another daughter to the King of Hungary, Andrew II, and this approach was incredibly successful in helping him retain his power. Henry sent troops to aid Bulgaria in its unsuccessful invasion of Serbia, while Andrew took Vidin after the local Kumans rebelled against Boriu and then returned the city to the Bulgarian Tsar. The only disturbance of this relatively peaceful period was Epirus retaking Thessaly, Dyrrhachium and Corfu while everyone else was distracted, but the status quo wouldn't last. In 1215, the ruler of Epirus was assassinated. In 1216, Pope Innocent III suddenly died. A month later, Emperor Henry was killed by poison, possibly by one of the Lombard nobles, all of which destabilized the region once again. When the new Pope, Honorius III, called for a fifth crusade to retake Jerusalem, Hungarian King Andrew II was the first to answer the call mustering the largest royal crusader army in history, which was transported to the Holy Lands by the Venetian fleet. The Latin Empire held a new election and chose Henry's Peter of Courtenay, who was the husband of Henry's sister, Yolanda. He was consecrated as the new Roman Emperor outside the walls of Rome by Pope Honorius III and began his journey to Constantinople. Meanwhile in Bulgaria, a pro-Bulgarian faction who financed and staged an uprising against Boriu replaced him with Ivan Asen II, who returned to his homeland with Rus mercenaries and blinded his uncle. Once on the throne, the new Tsar proved to be very different from the rest of his dynasty, as he did not pursue a war with any of his neighbours and maintained the truce with the Latins. When King Andrew II wanted to return to Hungary by land, even Asen II declared that he would allow his army to pass only if he marries his daughter, Anna Maria. The two houses were joined, and Bulgaria was given Belgrade and Branicevo, which were exchanged for the fifth time in our story. The warmongering opportunism that Bulgaria was known for since the uprising of his father, Even Asen I, was now replaced with caution and diplomacy 
which allowed the state to recover and rebuild while ending internal instability. On the opposite side of the spectrum, Epirus was now ruled by Theodore Ducas, an extremely ambitious man who was determined to restore the Eastern Roman Empire. After absorbing Alexius Slav and allying with Serbia, Theodore hosted what could be best described as the Red Wedding, luring the previously mentioned Peter of Courtenay with the offer of food and drink, as well as support for the Fifth Crusade. Once the Latins let their guard down, they were captured or massacred. Despite his betrayal, Theodore Ducas managed to trick the Pope into thinking he regretted his decision and would release his prisoners. Trying to save the life of the doomed emperor, Pope Honorius forced Venice to back down from the invasion they were preparing to retake Dyrrhachium. Instead, Theodore proceeded to expand in every direction, taking Neopatres and Lamia in the south, then Castle Platimon, Ceres and many other fortresses around Thessaloniki, which was completely cut off. This time the Pope excommunicated the Epirate ruler and mustered a large crusader army at Brindisi which made its way towards Ceres. However, the only remaining powerful crusader state of Moria did not assist this crusade, because the same Pope excommunicated its leader the previous year for mistreating the local clergy and declaring him an enemy of God, more inhuman than Pharaoh. In Nicaea, the successful ruler Theodore Wascaris died in 1221, which led to a succession crisis between his two brothers and his son-in-law. Emperor Robert I, the son of Peter, had just taken the throne of the Latin Empire that same year, and intervened on the side of the brothers, hoping to gain land and leverage in the east. And so in 1223, the new Nicaean Emperor, John III Vatazis, fought a Latin army under the two pretenders, which were decisively defeated, captured, and you guessed it, blinded. The news of the defeat reached the crusading army at Ceres, where many panicked and rushed to Constantinople to regroup and reconsider their strategy. On the way there, however, they were intercepted by Theodore Ducas, who destroyed the majority of the army. In the following two years, the Latins lost Thessaloniki to Epirus and signed a treaty with Nicaea which ceded all of their lands in Asia except for Nicomedia, only to be invaded immediately after and lose Adrianople as well. The Duchy of Morea became an independent state, and the Latin Empire was a mere prize the rest of the contenders fought over. Another desperate crusade was launched, trying to retake Thessaloniki, but the host was struck by dysentery, and those who didn't succumb to the illness returned to Italy. Theodore Ducas used this opportunity to crown himself Emperor of Thessaloniki, directly challenging Nicaea's claim and launching a campaign which took over much of Thrace, including Adrianople. He now began planning the final step towards the ultimate goal. In 1228, the reign of Emperor Robert came to an end with his death. This was the moment Ivanisen II was waiting for. He kept faith with the Catholic Church for a decade, upheld the alliances, resisted the urge to take advantage of the chaotic situation, and married into the royal family. Now, when the crown passed to the ten-year-old Baldwin II, the Tsar offered the hand of his daughter Helen and proposed to take up the regency, coming up with a plan on how the Latins could retake the lands they lost to Epirus. The nobles began negotiations with the Bulgarian ruler, but behind the scenes, they were frantically trying to find another regent, trying to pick the lesser of two evils. They found that candidate in the 60-year-old John of Brienne, a French noble who held the title of King of Jerusalem, but not the city itself. In order to get him to accept, the Latin nobles made a bizarre agreement. John would rule as regent until the heir turned 20, but at that point, Baldwin II would be emperor in name, with effective control over only the Latin holdings in Asia, which were almost non-existent. Furthermore, John's two sons would inherit Epirus and Macedonia upon his death, 
and once again, neither region was even close to being controlled by the Empire. Ivanasen II was furious, and instantly enacted a drastic change in policy, converting Bulgaria back to orthodoxy after three decades under Catholicism, and securing a marriage alliance with the Empire of Thessaloniki. Together they formed a coalition against the Latins and Nicaea. During that time, the rift between the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II and the Papacy was at an all-time high, and since John of Brienne was a strong supporter of the Pope, Frederick II sent a large contingent to Epirus to aid them in their conquest of Constantinople. In 1230, a massive army assembled in the second city of the Empire, ready to avenge the Fourth Crusade. But at the very last moment, Theodore Ducas changed his course and invaded Bulgaria instead, hoping to get rid of the rival he just allied. He was so confident in his victory that he brought his entire family and most of the aristocracy to witness his triumph. The army moved slowly, plundering villages and churches along the Maritza River. Once Ivan Asen II learned of this, he quickly rallied his forces and called in a small but elite Kuman contingent from the steppe, marching in front of the army with the treaty Theodore broke on his spear for all to see. The Bulgarians possessed a force of 10,000, a thousand of which were Kumans, positioned on a hill overlooking the Kokotnitsa River, while the invaders had an army of 20,000 with a sizable contingent of German knights. The speed of the Bulgarians caught Theodore completely off guard, but he was still poised to show off his military might and reaffirm that he was the true emperor of the Romans. So he ordered his army to cross the river and crush the numerically inferior side, while his family and supporters watched from the camp. The spring crossing of the river, defended by the Bulgarian infantry, caused heavy casualties, slowed down the army and threw it into disarray. At the critical moment in the battle, the Kuman mounted archers, who were patiently waiting on the forested hill, leaped into action. The fighting quickly turned into a slaughter, and Theodore Dukas found himself pressed between the Bulgarian line and the river he and his men barely crossed, while the nomadic marksmen decimated his rear and captured the camp. Yet again the Kumans played a vital role in the Bulgarian success, and the majority of the enemy army and emperor's retinue was captured, except for Manuel Dukas, the emperor's brother, who fought his way back with a small force. Once again, in a stark contrast to his predecessors, Ivan Asen II pardoned all the soldiers and followers in the enemy army and allowed them to return home, while holding on to the nobility which he treated with respect. With just one strike, the Bulgarian Tsar annexed the majority of the Eastern Balkans as people flocked to him and changed sides. From that moment onwards, he styled himself as the King of the Bulgarians, Romans and other peoples. And so yet another competitor in the race to Constantinople was eliminated, and two unlikely candidates, the Second Bulgarian Tsardom and Nikian Empire, stared each other down. The fate of the region now hung in the balance between the two. In 1230, after just one decisive encounter, the lands of the Second Bulgarian Tsardom stretched from Thessaly to Belgrade and from Dyrrhachium to Adrianople. The Serbian king, Stefan Radoslav, who supported the now captured ruler of Epirus, Theodore Dukas, became the next target, and after a successful raiding campaign, he was replaced by his brother, Stefan Władysław, in 1234. The latter was positively predisposed towards Ivan II, and even married his daughter, and the two orthodox nations formed a bulwark against Hungarian expansion and Cumans, who recently broke off. With that front secure, the Tsar now looked to Nikia for an alliance against the Latin Empire. He was concerned with accomplishing his dream of restoring the empire, as evident from the coins he minted, showing him with the symbols of imperial power. The regent, John of Brienne, wasn't idle, 
as he brought in 500 fresh knights and 5,000 infantry with the help of Venice to Constantinople, and prepared to make his last stand. However, the reluctance to attack in either direction didn't suit the French knights, and most of them abandoned his cause. But it was in this very critical moment that Geoffrey II succeeded his father as Prince of Morea and pledged his full support to the Latin Empire, sending John 30,000 gold coins annually. The stage was set, and in the summer of 1235, Ivan II of Bulgaria and John III Vitatsits of Nicaea laid siege to Constantinople, which was defended by John of Brienne, a small garrison, and 160 knights. Venice immediately responded to the call to aid, as the Pope was urging Christendom to protect the Queen of Cities and shift their focus from the Holy Land to the Latin Empire, and 25 galleys reinforced the city. The wall was attacked from multiple sides, but the energetic regent managed to repulse the attackers each time, before charging at the enemy camp with a small band of heavy knights, inflicting heavy casualties on the besiegers. Some chroniclers even described his valour and skills to equal that of Hector of Troy. The Nikian fleet, which had 100 galleys, attempted to penetrate the Golden Horn, but it took heavy losses against the Venetians, and the siege was broken. On the 16th of December, the two forces regrouped and laid siege to the city once more, after the Venetians had sailed back home. This siege lasted well into the spring of 1236, until a massive fleet came to the aid of Constantinople, composed of the fleets of Venice, Genoa, Pisa and Morea. Geoffrey II alone brought 100 knights, 300 crossbowmen and 500 archers, and together they lifted the blockade. After their defeat, the Nicaeans and Bulgarians signed a two-year truce with the Latin Empire. But the failure had a profound effect on Ivan II, who once again radically changed his stance. After John of Brienne died in 1237, and the throne passed to 20-year-old Baldwin II, the Tsar hoped he would become regent, so he broke off his alliance with Nicaea, allied with the Latins, and started a correspondence with the Pope in an effort to reconvert back to Catholicism. These actions might have been taken under the pressure of a new crusade which was being organized as Baldwin II toured France, selling precious artifacts in his attempt to gather a large army to recover the lost lands. The Tsar continued to call himself Emperor of Bulgarians and Greeks, and wanted to take Constantinople, but his policy changed as he continued to fund massive building projects which would transform the capital of Tornovo into the third Rome. The massive Saravets royal citadel, which was situated on a hill and surrounded by a river, was expanded and became a spiritual center after the Tsar brought dozens of precious relics and built a patriarchal church. The two palaces were built to symbolize the relation between the spiritual and the secular authority a symbolism derived directly from Byzantine culture. He minted gold coins in Orid, bearing his image, and traded extensively with Regusan merchants, leading to a reign of stability and prosperity, while he deliberated on how to further expand his influence. While the various contenders were fighting for Constantinople, a dark cloud which travelled all the way from Karakorum was ready to consume them all. The Mongols had reached the Kievan Rus, inflicting destruction on a massive scale. Kumans fled in their wake, and this giant host of nomadic people, which played a key role in the establishment of the Bulgarian Empire, now wreaked havoc in Thrace and Macedonia, and there was nothing Ivan II could do to stop them. So instead, he hired some of them to assist his army in the joint siege of Soilum by the Bulgarians and Latins in 1237. It seemed that the uneasy alliance would lead to the complete conquest of Thrace by Bulgaria, while the Latins were hoping to regain land on the coast of the Propontis. But then news arrived that plague broke out in Tornovo, taking the lives of many, including the Patriarch and Ivanesen's wife and son. 
the Tsar was overwhelmed with grief and took this as a divine sign that betraying the Nicaeans and fighting alongside the Latins was wrong, so he burned down his siege engines and abandoned the siege. The relations with Nicaea were restored without any hostilities towards the Latins as the Bulgarian state took an ambivalent stance towards the regional conflicts and prepared for the impending Mongol invasion. Now a widower, Ivana Sen II married Irene, the daughter of Theodore Ducas, who was a guest since the Battle of Korkotnitsa, alongside her father, who was blinded after a failed attempt to stir a riot. Immediately after the marriage, Theodore Ducas was freed and returned to Thessaloniki disguised as a beggar. His blindness meant that he was unable to rule according to custom, but it seemed that plotting was in his blood since he immediately usurped his brother Manuel and placed his son John in his place. Normally this would outrage the Bulgarian overlord, but his newfound love for Theodore's daughter neutralized his usual temperament. Manuel, however, was not too happy and started a civil war within the country with the aid of John III Vitezes. The two sides eventually agreed to divide the realm, with Manuel receiving most of Thessaly while Michael II Ducas, Theodore's nephew, controlled Epirus. In 1239, Baldwin II finally returned at the head of a massive crusader army, 700 knights and 30,000 footmen, which were allowed passage through Bulgaria to take the majority of the land Nicaea controlled in Thrace. A year later, Kiev was raised by the Mongols, prompting Hungary and Bulgaria to sign a defense pact as thousands of Kumans penetrated their borders. Ivan Asen II realized the dangers these nomads posed as he learned of the chaos which unfolded after Bela IV of Hungary tried to weaponize many of them, so he secretly killed thousands of Kuman men, women and children before they could erode his authority from within. Bulgaria was now the most dominant power in the Balkans, and knew exactly which tactics the Mongols would employ against them. However, fate had other plans, as Ivan Asen II became the first and only member of the Asen dynasty to die of natural causes in 1241. He was succeeded by his son Kaliman, who was only seven at the time, and while there was no war of succession, the country was left in the hands of a regency. That same year, the Mongols under Batu devastated Hungary and Poland. They proceeded to ravage Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia and Bulgaria until they reached the Theodosian Walls. Emperor Baldwin II's army was completely annihilated in a classic feigned retreat somewhere in Thrace, and this turned Constantinople into a Mongol tributary. On their way back, the Mongols repeated the Byzantine mistake and were caught in a Bulgarian ambush in a mountain pass, sustaining heavy casualties. This only made matters worse for the Tsardom, however, as the wrath of the Khans rolled over the countryside, laying waste to the citadels of Vidin, Tornovo, Drista, Kweswaf, Schumann, Vana, Cherven, Wovic, Svistov, and the majority of the countryside, until the regency agreed to pay a yearly tribute to what would become the Golden Horde. Meanwhile, a completely different Mongol force under Baiju was sent to subjugate Anatolia after the Seljuk Sultan of Rum failed to pay homage in Karakorum. After Erzurum fell in the winter of 1242, Sultan Caicosraw II organized a massive force comprised of Seljuks, Latin mercenaries, Armenians, Nicaeans, Trapezuntines, Georgians, and even a large force sent by the Ayyubid Prince of Aleppo, which was ready to meet the Mongols. However, yet again a confident sultan, with just a quarter of his force, ignored his generals and rode out to meet his foe, only to be lured into a feigned retreat and be defeated. The Mongols took over Sivas and Kayseri without much opposition, before making the Sultanate of Rum and Empire of Trebizond their newest tributaries. The Nicaean Emperor realized that there was much to gain within this new political landscape, and he began by inviting the ambitious Theodore Ducas to a feast. 
There was no red wedding this time, but Ducas was not allowed to leave, even as he accompanied Don III's army, which took the now leaderless Thessaloniki. Theodore's son was allowed to keep the city, but swore fealty to Nicaea, while Michael II Ducas, who had recently taken over Thessaly, remained neutral. As for Serbia, Stefan Władysław was left powerless after the Mongols ravaged his country and crushed his Bulgarian allies. And in 1243, his brother Stefan Urosh rebelled and replaced him. Urosh would prove to be a capable administrator and diplomat and initiate extensive mining excavations, which would transform Serbia from a buffer state neighbors fought for into a regional power. In 1246, the young Tsar Keliman and the Patriarch, who was in favor of uniting the Bulgarian church with the Roman one, were both poisoned, most likely by Keliman's stepmother, Irene, whose seven-year-old son, Michael II Asen, took the throne under a new regency, which was very hostile towards Hungary and the papacy. The demoralized and exhausted Bulgarian state was immediately attacked by Michael II Dukas, who took over Albania and northern Macedonia, while John III Vitatsis captured Ceres, where the Bulgarian commander Dragotas switched sides and not only helped the Nikian campaign, but convinced the locals to accept the rule of the Emperor of Nicaea, flipping most of the Via Ignatia. In August 1247, this allowed John III, in cooperation with the Bulgarians and Cumans, to take over the remaining Latin garrisons in Thrace. He was now breathing down the neck of Baldwin II, who once again toured Europe for reinforcements, even leaving his son as collateral in Venice as a promise to repay his debts. In the same period, William II of Morea finally completed the conquest of the Peloponnese by capturing Monemvasia and accompanied the French king on his doomed Seventh Crusade, during which a band of Genoans captured neutral roads before they were expelled by the Nicaeans. In the spring of 1251, Theodore Ducas hatched his final plot as he and his nephew, Michael II Ducas, launched a surprise attack on Thessaloniki. The city managed to resist the attack until John III crossed along with his army, forcing the Epirates to retreat. Nicaea took the initiative by taking several fortresses up to Castoria, and after a brief skirmish, two Epirates generals and the governor of Kruja switched sides, thus ending the war in a treaty which not only expanded Nicaea, but handed over the troublemaker Theodore Ducas, who was imprisoned and killed shortly after. The successful campaign was the last one John III would ever undertake, as he died in 1254, leaving the throne and a powerful empire to be inherited by his son, Theodore Wascaris II. The new emperor was very promising, and immediately gave his close companions high offices based on their merit and not their blood, which displeased a large portion of the nobility, and even elevated a hermit named Arsenius to the Patriarchy. As soon as the news of the death of John III reached Tornovo, the Tsar organized a campaign and reclaimed much of Nicaean Thrace, but Theodore Wascaris II personally led a counterattack which broke the Bulgarian army, and Michael II was forced to sign an unfavorable peace, which made him seem weak in the eyes of his boyars. Soon after, he was murdered by his cousin on a hunt, who was himself assassinated by another cousin until eventually, a man named Constantine Tich ascended to the throne with Boya support in 1257. This new Tsar, descended from the Serbian royal family, was the first to ascend not by means of dynastic legitimacy, but Boya election, and this would start an unbroken pattern until Bulgaria's disappearance in 1393, one which would decentralize the state and put it in the hands of various feudal lords. With Bulgaria vanquished, Theodore Wascaris II was now in a position of absolute power, so he demanded that Epirus cede Servia and Dyrrhachium to complete his dominion over the Via Ignatia. Michael II Ducas 
was in no position to refuse, but the demand pushed him to a radical last-ditch effort to defeat Nicaea by allying with the Duchy of Morea and marrying his daughter to King Manfred of Sicily, who had just taken Derechium. That coalition wasn't Theodore Wascaris's only problem, as he suffered from a disease, most likely a brain tumour, which got significantly worse in November 1257 and impacted his judgement. He believed that his madness was caused by the sorcery of his courtiers, especially Maria Palaiologos, so he had her thrown in a sack filled with cats, before he panicked that she may curse him again and released her. Fearing her brother's revenge, he imprisoned Michael Palaiologos, but then set him free. In 1258, Theodore even named his eight-year-old son John as sole heir under the guardianship of his best friend George, before retreating to a monastery where he died as a monk. Wanting to reduce the tension, George called an assembly of nobles planning to resign, but to his dismay, the group, led by Michael Palaiologos, encouraged him to keep his rank and swore oaths of loyalty to him and the young emperor. It was all part of a conspiracy. A few days after the death of Theodore II, a memorial service was held in his honour in a monastery, which served as his burial place. The entire court attended, with the army encamped on a nearby plain. As soon as George and his brothers arrived, the service began. The soldiers and Latin mercenaries wanted to see the young emperor, who went outside and raised his hand to quiet them. But the men mistook this as their signal, and leapt into the middle of the procession, swords in hand, along with a large mob, which found George hiding under an altar. He was brutally murdered, while his estate was ransacked by the outraged populace. Everyone who was close to the previous emperor was brutally murdered, while the man who instigated the plot, Michael Palaiologos, proclaimed himself co-emperor alongside the young John IV. Even with the backing of the clergy and nobility, this usurpation hung by a thread, ready to be snapped by the anti nicaean coalition. So Michael sent his brother John, who quickly raced to Castoria, catching the Epirates off guard, while their allies were still scattered throughout northern Greece. Manfred was busy in Italy, and sent 400 elite knights, who joined the leaders of Epirus, Morea, Archipelago, Evia, and their considerable hosts. The Nicaean army was composed of Greek contingents from Asia, Macedonia, and Thrace, backed by 300 German knights, 1,500 Hungarian mounted archers, 600 Serbian horsemen, Bulgarian cavalry, 1,500 Seljuk and 2,000 Kuman cavalry, and some Latins. For the first time since the sack of Constantinople, the conflict involved two sides, which included every major state in the region. Over 50 years of constant plotting, betrayal, conflicts and marriages led to this moment. The numerous participants of this campaign make the task of estimating the two sides impossible, but the outcome of this battle would determine who would rule the region. After Michael II Ducas was pushed out of Castoria and suffered many casualties in his retreat, he regrouped with his allies near Pelagonia. John knew he was outnumbered, so instead of engaging in an all-out battle, he performed hit-and-run tactics with his nomadic contingents, plundering the Nicaean baggage trains, while positioning his heavily armoured knights in good defensive positions. In the meantime, he sent spies to the enemy camp, which spread misinformation and rumours about betrayal and desertion from one contingent to another. On one occasion, the illegitimate son of Michael II Ducas was angry at several knights from Morea, who were openly flirting with his wife, but when he pointed it out to their commander, he was dismissed as a bastard. This prompted a large detachment to change sides and start a cascade which neutralized the entire Epirate contingent. Having learned of the enemy's plans and positions, John struck a devastating blow against the army of Morea, capturing its leader and securing the western frontier. 
but he was unable to gain any new lands because of the difficult terrain and pulled back to prepare for the upcoming 1260 siege of Constantinople. Nicaea mobilized its army and navy, built large siege towers and sent agents within the city, but despite all of their efforts, the Latins barely held on. Michael knew he needed naval support to finish the job, so in 1261 he signed a treaty with Genoa to counterweight the powerful Venetian presence in the region. That same year, he sent a general at the head of 800 Cumans to keep an eye on the Bulgarians and scout the defences of the city. But as they came across one of the nearby villages of Salimbria, a few farmers told them that the Latins and Venetians had left the city to raid a Nikian island. The general considered his chances, knowing that if they failed to penetrate the city, the returning army would have no trouble wiping them out. But in the end, he decided to try the gamble. On the night of the 24th of July 1261, he and his men hid at a monastery near the city gates before entering through a secret passage. After a short struggle, the guards, who were taken completely by surprise, were killed, and the Venetian quarter was set ablaze. Panic spread through the city, and Emperor Baldwin II rushed out to save his life, evacuating along with many other Latins with the help of the Venetian fleet, which came just in time to save them, but not the city. At dawn, Michael refused to believe what had just happened, until a second messenger brought him the imperial crown and sword, which Baldwin forgot in his flight. He quickly moved to the city and crowned himself emperor of the restored Roman Empire. To solidify his claim, that Christmas he blinded John IV on his 15th birthday, banished him to a monastery, and married his three sisters to lesser Latin and Bulgarian nobles in an attempt to wipe out his bloodline an act which would lead to his excommunication by his own patriarch. The newly established Palaiologos dynasty would become the last and longest ruling dynasty of the Eastern Roman Empire, and dedicate most of its attention to rivalries in the west and within, rarely paying any mind to the new storm brewing on its eastern frontier. After all, what was a small Turkic Beylik to the restored empire? We will talk about the history of the region more in the coming months, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.